Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created us from a single soul. And from this soul he created its mate. And from the two of them he spread forth multitudes of men and women. And may Allah's peace and blessings be upon the prophets of Allah, Adam alayhi salam, and those who followed him, culminating in the prophethood of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As to what follows, it is clear that the theory of evolution is considered to be a scientific fact amongst large segments of the world. Indeed, some have argued that there is almost ijma' consensus amongst the scientific community that all life as we know it, including human life, originated from a universal common ancestor. The primary opposition to this theory seems to come almost exclusively from religious circles who view their scriptures as providing an alternative explanation of the origins of life. This being the case, then we as Muslims, and especially the ulama, the clergy, the scholars, cannot afford to be blind to this clash. We need to be courageous enough to realize that this conflict poses a serious challenge regarding not just our current understanding of the scriptures, but for some Muslims, it even calls into question the divine nature of the Qur'an itself. Many Muslims, and especially those educated in the modern sciences, wonder whether it is even possible to reconcile these divergent points of view. Thus, the topic of evolution and Islam stands on it is one that deserves much academic study. And it is for this reason that I welcome dialogues such as this one, where we can engage in frank discussions and present different points of view. This particular conversation that my, inter my interlocutor, Mr. Hassan, and myself are having is a theological one by Muslims, for Muslims, and based on the sources that Muslims hold sacred. The key question of our debate is the following. Is the idea that humans evolve from non-human ancestors a theologically and scripturally valid position for Muslims to hold in light of the Quran and in light of the prophetic teachings? I am not a biologist, and our discussion, my discussion, does not concern the biological possibility of human evolution. Rather, I am addressing fellow Muslims who believe in a divine book that has been revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a book that describes itself as being a guide for mankind, revealed in clear and eloquent Arabic, and a clarification for all matters. Therefore, this discussion, this dialogue, is a very specific discussion for a very specific niche, and that is the believers. And frankly, I don't expect our conversation to be understood or even frankly to be of much relevance to those outside of our faith tradition. I would like to preface my talk by pointing out that I do not view this conversation as being a debate between religion and science. I firmly believe, and in fact my religion asks me to believe, that any established truth cannot contradict an authoritative Islamic text. Science is our attempt to understand Allah's creation. And any established fact in this human endeavor cannot contradict the Qur'an, since the study of Allah's creation is a study of Allah's power. And the Qur'an is a study of Allah's speech. And Allah's power and Allah's speech will not contradict each other. Therefore, if a conflict exists between religion and science, it must be a perceived conflict and not an actual conflict. In this case, when there's a conflict, there are only one of three logical scenarios that a Muslim can follow. Firstly, to say that neither science nor religion has an established authoritative position. An example for this can be the existence of alien life forms. Neither science nor religion confirms or denies the existence of aliens. Therefore, a Muslim or a scientist can choose whatever he or she wishes to believe in, and there is no clash. Secondly, that science has achieved a level of indubitable certainty, in Arabic, yaqeen, while religious texts are ambiguous in meaning. An example of this is the rotations of the earth and the sun. While it is true that linguistically and even historically, it is true that it is possible 
to interpret a handful of verses as conveying a geocentric interpretation of the solar system, the bulk of scholars have demonstrated that this interpretation of these verses is not conclusive and that a heliocentric, by that I mean the sun revolving, that the, the earth revolves around the sun, uh, the heliocentric interpretation is just as plausible. This being the case, our understanding of modern science will shape our understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. The final scenario, that the Quran and Sunnah presents a position that is beyond dispute, while science presents an interpretation of data that conflicts with that position. It is my humble opinion and the opinion of the vast majority of Muslim scholars that the theory of evolution is the perfect example of this last category. And in this case, we as Muslims have no logical alternative other than to accept the Quranic text and to acknowledge that our human limitations and realizations are not fully, uh, infinitely uh, capable of understanding these mysteries and truly resign ourselves to, know, to say that Allah knows best. It is for this reason that I will take my theology from authoritative religious texts rather than speculative interpretations of scientific data. Therefore, I firmly believe, as Muslims across the world believe, that Islamic texts are clear on the origins of man. Both the Quran and the Sunnah inform us that humankind descended from Adam and Eve and that they were the first humans created directly by Allah and that they were not born to parents or otherwise evolved from previous life forms. I believe that any attempt to contradict or modify this Islamic argument is scripturally indefensible, historically flawed, and methodologically shallow. I offer the following three arguments in support of this view. The first argument, the scriptural evidences. The evidences from the Quran and Sunnah on the creation of humankind from only two parents is simply too numerous and too explicit to summarize in a lecture of this nature. The Quran states in at least half a dozen verses that mankind originated from a single soul, Adam. That Allah created that soul's spouse from it, خَلَقَ مِنْهَا أَنْ جَعَلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا That Allah shaped, صَوَّرَ Adam from طين اللازب, which is a type of clay, and صلصاد كالفخار, another type of clay, and حما مَسْنُونَ, which is yet a third type of clay, meaning three stages came about. And the Quran tells us that Allah created Adam with his two hands, بِمَا خَلَقْتُ day. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed his ruh into Adam. نَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And that is what made Adam so unique from the other creatures. The hadith literature is even more explicit. In the sahih works which Sunni Islam considers to be authoritative and in other works beyond the sahih, we are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a handful of soil from the earth, various portions of the earth, and he fashioned the shape of Adam with his hands. And this fashioning was done in Jannah. And that Allah allowed that lifeless body to remain there for a period of time. Our Prophet ﷺ told us that shaitan, before the soul was breathed into Adam, went around this lifeless body, poking him and entering him and exiting him and threatening him. We are told in the prophetic hadith, sahih literature, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed the ruh into the head of Adam and as it reached his nose he sneezed and the first thing he said was Alhamdulillah. We are told that there was a time when Adam was bain ruhi wa turab between the body and the soul, between the spirit and the clay that Adam had not yet formed from these two components. In around half a dozen verses Allah tells us that he created us from first from dust and then from seminal fluid. Perhaps the most explicit is Surah Sajda, verses 7 to 8. وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينَ ثُمَّ جَعَلَ نَسْلَهُ مِنْ سُلَادَةٍ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينَ Allah began the creation of man from teen, from clay. Then, thumma, and in Arabic thumma always means then, afterwards. Then he made him create his progeny. Then he made him to have progeny through ma'in mahin, which is, uh, which is uh, sperm. Which means Adam did not come from a biological mating. Adam did not come from some type of union. Allah says, وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينَ Insan began with teen. Then Allah said, we started making him with uh, which is basically the seminal fluid and the evidences go on and on. 
Adam coming down from Jannah, which we'll come back to, and the creation of Hawa from Adam, and the evidences and the explicit details go on and on. Essentially, the entire corpus of the Quran and Sunnah presents such a vivid picture of the story of the Adamic creation that to claim that man has descended from other creations is to make a claim that contradicts numerous explicit verses from the Quran and numerous dozens of authenticated ahadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, had the story of Adam been based on a lone ambiguous text that allowed multiple linguistic interpretations and modern science informed us that a particular interpretation is more plausible, then of course, we as rational Muslims would adopt that interpretation. Science can and should shape our understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, but only where this reinterpretation would be permitted by the rules of language and exegesis. Science cannot ask us to reject the Quran and Sunnah. As an example of this refashioning, Allah Azza wa Jal says that He created the heavens and the earth fi sittati ayyam. Now, Sittati Ayyam has traditionally been understood as six days, 24 hour periods, days. However, and the word Yawm does mean a day. However, if you look up the classical lexicons of the Arabic language, for example, Raghab al-Asfahani is one of the earliest uh, lexicographers of the Arabic language. He says in this book, uh, Mufradat al-Quran, he says, a Yawm generally means a day, 24 hours. However, it can apply to any period of time. So the word yom can be interpreted to mean six stages, each stage being a particular length that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now that modern science tells us that the world was not created in six units of 24 hours, I have no qualms and most Muslims have no qualms re-understanding the verse of sittati ayyam to mean six stages rather than six 24 hour periods. However, in the case of the story of Genesis, of the story of Adam, we have such an explicit narrative, one that is deeply rooted in countless patches, passages throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah, that there is no choice other than to accept that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Prophet intended for us to believe. The sheer quantity and diversity of nouns, adjectives and verbs used simply makes any linguistic reinterpretation or ta'wil so imaginative, so fanciful, as to render such an endeavor mere hermeneutical gymnastics. Fun to look at, but of no practical value. Frankly, there is no logical way for a Muslim to contradict this entire account, A to Z, verse by verse and hadith by hadith, except by claiming that the whole story is a fable. It's allegorical. It's something that God wished to appease and hold in check those of lower intellectual backgrounds and it's not meant to be understood at face value. Now such a claim might actually make more sense logically, but it leads to disastrous and blasphemous implications about Allah Azza wa Jal, about Allah's truthfulness, about the function of the Prophet and about the role of the Quran. Now, my interlocutor, Mr. Hassan, claims that his interpretations have been championed by previous scholars. And this, of course, is an appeal to authority. Let us, for the moment, ignore the fact that the people that he has quoted, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Miskaway, Ar-Rumi, are not actually authorities in either biology or in theology. Frankly, who even heard of Ibn Miskaway from the masses before my interlocutor began mentioning his name? Let us ignore this fact that these are not actual authorities. Frankly, I cannot believe that my interlocutor is still making such claims. To claim that Ibn Khaldun or Ibn Miskaway believed in evolution is an egregious mistake of the highest magnitude. And it is embarrassing for someone like myself to have to point this out to someone who is as highly educated as yourself. As the poet said, and I have heard you quote this to me once in a previous lifetime of ours, uh, as a poet said, in kunta tadri fa tilka musiba, wa in kunta la tadri fa musiba tu a'zamu. If you know what you're saying, this is a problem. And if you don't know, then the problem is even bigger. Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Miskaway and the Ikhwan al Safa before them were referring to the ancient Greek concept of scala naturae, natural scale, or in English it's called the great chain of being. 
in which every object in existence is placed in a linear scale, beginning with the, with the minerals and ending with God himself. The purpose of this scala natura, the great chain, was to give legal and moral weight to those higher up in the scale, vis-a-vis -vis those who were below it. There is no suggestion that there is a progression from one state to another. Rather, these are static states vis-a-vis -vis one another. And these people, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Miskawe, and the Ikhwan al-Safa, adopted it from Greek Hellenistic Aristotelian thought. Frankly, I'm curious. Have you actually read Ibn Miskawe's Al-Fawz al asghar In case you haven't done so, I have a, a gift for you. You can take it. It is Al-Fawz al asghar in case you have not read it, because I cannot believe you could have read Al-Fawz al asghar and still make the claim that Ibn Miskawe believes in evolution. Both Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Miskawe have those passages that you quoted in their sections on prophecy, on nubuwa, and their intent is to place prophets in the highest category of humans. Just like they claim that the highest category of animals is ape, and it's almost touching that of man, so too they later on claim in the same passage, in the same paragraph, in the same page, they claim that men themselves are of different categories, and the highest level of man is that of prophets. And those prophets are almost touching the level of the angels, clearly. This is their Islamic adaptation of the Hellenistic scala naturae because as far as I know, no one, not even my good interlocutor, claims that prophets evolve into angels. And by the way, both of these authors, Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Miskawe, and I apologize for having to say this in, uh, on stage because uh, it is not something polite to say about them, uh, but I will say it because my interlocutor is using them as evidences and as, uh, and as authorities. Both Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Miskawe use the exact same concept of the scala naturae to mention that different races of humans occupy different levels and that is why certain zunuj, certain zend, which is a derogatory term for people, certain people in Africa, they occupy the lowest level of humanity, quote, right above that of animals. And that is why they may be subjugated and may be enslaved and they have never produced a civilization, end quote. Surely, we can all agree that these authors are not talking about human evolution, but they're talking about this grand cosmological change. And if you don't have time to read, there are many books and articles about the great chain of being. And if you don't have time to read it, perhaps my interlocutor can even look up the Wikipedia page on it because it actually has a semi-decent article, the great chain of being, look it up. As a last clarification, on the very same page of Ibn Miskawais al Fawz al Asghar, which you're going to have a copy to give to you, on the very same page of the passage that you quoted, he mentions a fabricated tradition. It's fabricated from our perspective. But nonetheless, he mentions what he thinks is a hadith about Allah's creation of Adam from, clean, from clay. And by the way, this error of reading in biological evolution, you are quoting Mr. Hamidullah, and I have the greatest respect for Ustad Hamidullah, may Allah Azza wa Jalla have mercy on his soul. But it is an error of the highest magnitude, and it has been pointed out by many specialists in the field. Uh, for example, T.J. Bower in 1903, over 110 years ago, pointed out that it is a mistake to read in uh, a bi a bi biological evolution into the writings of Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Miskawe, and there are others as well, I have their names if you're interested. To summarize the first point, the corpus of the Islamic texts cannot faithfully be interpreted, and no one in our history before the modern era has ever interpreted the Qur'an as somehow supporting the modern doctrine of human evolution. The second argument is to understand the role and philosophy of science. We need to put science in its proper place. The methodology of science, in simplest terms, works by collecting the observable data in the natural world and interpreting them to come up for an explanation for why the world is the way it is. These expl explanations can then be used to make further predictions. Most scientists acknowledge that we have no direct means of knowing whether our explanation actually corresponds to reality. People who attempt to transform scientific models into theological dogma are forgetting two basic facts. Firstly, I have two pages left in short. Firstly, science requires that we stick to empirical matters and that we not invoke metaphysical explanation. This immediately disqualifies any supernatural account on the origins of man. Moreover, 
in order to make theories about what took place at an unseen time thousands of years ago, we can only make inferences based upon our interpretation of the data that has survived up until today. Secondly, a scientific explanation is required to be the simplest naturalistic explanation possible through Occam's razor. Therefore, if we observe a pattern in animal species, the simplest explanation is to extrapolate from the animal realm to the human realm as well. However, it is theology that causes us to pause at this extrapolation. While Islamic theology is silent on the macroevolution of animal species, there are clear texts that indicate the origin of humans is different. And also, even science itself points out many of these differences in humanity, consciousness, morality, civilization, language, metacognition, the arts, and so on and so forth. These aspects are not as easily explained as, say, fingers and legs and appendices, and evolutionary explanations in these areas are fraught with untestable speculations. To summarize the second point before I move on to the final point, science has a function, a scope, and a role. Let's keep science within that scope. The final argument, the third argument, is the argument from history. Muslims need to stress that our history is markedly different from the history of Christianity. Islamic civilizations never had any issues with scientific developments and in fact encouraged the study of all natural sciences. Muslims don't have the equivalent of Copernicus's and Galileo's. No scientist was ever burnt at the stake. No scientific book ever banned. Therefore, it is a mistake of the highest magnitude to lump Muslims who question one aspect of human evolution with those religious creationists of other faith traditions who deny the entire theory of evolution. Also, I must point out here that previous Muslim thinkers have faced plenty of intellectual threats and challenges in their days. And there have been many groups who attempted to quote-unquote reconcile what they thought was indubitable evidence with the Qur'an and Sunnah and all of these attempts history has shown have been proven to be failures. The Qur'an has withstood the test of time. Science, on the other hand, continues to remain evolving. And this is something, by the way, some of the great scientific minds, Thomas Kuhn, in his seminal work released 50 years ago, entitled The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, discusses many such paradigm shifts. Incidentally, he was the one who introduced the term paradigm shift, which you hear about in modern vernacular. He was the one who introduced this term. For all that we know, 50 years from now, our entire understanding of the history of human origins will have drastically changed. As great as human rationality is, it is fundamentally limited. And there are many basic questions regarding existence that defy all human attempts at explanation. To reinterpret the divine speech of Allah based on fallible, changing, historically influenced, man-made explanations is the height of religious arrogance. Conclusion. It is a mistake for Muslims to say we don't believe in evolution. This is a mistake. Quite the contrary. And I say here very firmly for the record. Most of the principles of evolution pose no problems with Islamic theology. Muslims, unlike some of their Christian counterparts, have no issues believing in dinosaur, dinosaurs, believing in hominids before mankind, uh, believing in genetic mutations, believing in speciation, or extrapolating the human lineage or the human timeline beyond 6,000 years. In fact, I go so far as to say, that Islamically, it is not problematic whatsoever to accept a universal common ancestor for all life on earth, with one exception, and that is humankind. Muslims also need to realize evolutionary science is not bad science. It's not a Western hegemonic global conspiracy that aims to turn Muslims into godless heathens. Rather. It is a well-researched scientific model that fits the criterion of proper science, but it also has the limitations that any scientific theory would have. As a Muslim, I can accept the broad premises of evolution as a scientific model that makes excellent predictions about the world, while at the same time recognizing that its inferences are limited in nature and that only the divine speech of Allah can provide an exact description of the reality of what happened. Finally, I remind my fellow believers, that it is within the realm of religion to believe in miracles. 
for those who believe in an all-powerful God, for those who believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, for those who believe in the parting the Red Sea by Moses, for those who believe in Shaq al-Qamar by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is so difficult about believing that the creation of man was an even greater miracle? If a Muslim biologist were to claim, not me, if a Muslim biologist were to claim that all life on this earth followed the patterns proposed by the theory of evolution and ascribed the power to do this to Allah, and claim that the mechanisms that Allah used to form animals and plants is indeed genetic mutations over the course of billions of years, but that there was only one species that broke this rule, our species, and that for us, humankind, Allah inserted a primogenitor, a uh, Adam alayhi salam, and in such a manner that his DNA, his biological structure, fit perfectly into the grand scale of things as planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If somebody were to claim this, then I, as a Muslim theologian, would not have any Islamic qualms about this. Such a miracle, if it occurred, can neither be proven nor disproven scientifically, but it would explain many differences that man has from other species. Surely, instead of arrogating the knowledge of exactly how things happened to one's own interpretation, it is not unreasonable, it is not illogical to believe, as Allah says, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ Doesn't the one who created know best? I conclude by reminding you of the verse in the Quran, Surah Al-Kahf, verse 51. Surah Al-Kahf 51. مَا أَشْهَدْتُهُمْ خَلْقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا خَلْقَ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah is speaking in the first person. I did not call them to witness the creation of the heavens and earth, nor did I call them to witness their own creation. We were not here to see how we came into existence, but Allah was. Everything that we posit, all of it, is but our attempt at reconstructing the mysteries of Allah's creation. For those who don't believe in a God, for those who don't believe in a divine revelation, let them attempt to reconstruct the puzzle as they see fit. But for us who believe in an all-knowing God, who has revealed a blessed book to a knowledgeable prophet, let them trust the one who created and realize that indeed of knowledge you have been given but little. وجزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته